Make Real specializes in creating immersive learning solutions across a range of technologies. To download their latest academic paper on how to turn learners into activists, visit makereal.co.uk slash activists. Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack Team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this highly acclaimed series, Professor Donald Clark, internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode focuses on happiness. Utilitarianism is a strand in philosophy that says the greatest happiness of the greatest number should guide our judgment in all things, including education. But does its modern antecedent, positive psychology, place too much trust in looking on the bright side? Happiness, happiness, the greatest gift that I possess. I thank the Lord that I've been blessed with more than my share of happiness. These are the lyrics of a song written by American country musician Bill Anderson, best known in the UK through the version recorded by comedian and singer the late, great Ken Dodd. It was his signature tune, and happiness is our signature theme for this episode of Great Minds on Learning. And welcome to it. Donald, you usually like to pack in at least half a dozen theorists to an episode, and sometimes you squeeze an extra one at the last minute, which can be quite hair-raising, but this time only three. Does that mean, A, there's a lot to say about each of these figures, or B, that there's not that much in general to say about happiness? Which would be sad, but at least it would make for a short episode. Yeah, well, we, yeah, we'd, unusually we only have three, Bentham, Mill, and then Seligman. Uh, actually, and we're going to be discussing this happiness, happy camper thing, uh, yeah. and, but there's some big themes that emerge from these, these three alone. Uh, you know the whole notion of what, what is the good life. You know how do, how should how do we get satisfaction from life? Uh, should learning be fun? Uh, should it be based on happiness? Or and then other issues such as uh, the libertarian issues around freedom of expression. It's all de rigueur now, of course. So there are a number of big themes that come out of just these three players. But it's interesting to give it some context. I think John, it's a good, mm. good question as to why there's only three. But of course, there isn't only three. Everything has. Uh, a backstory, and the backstory here goes way back to Plato, Aristotle especially, I think, uh, Epicurus, but Aristotle in particular, who has this, you know, deep examination of what is the good life, hmm. the, and for him, the, the happy life isn't a happy life, happy, happy uh, uh, life, as it is for Bentham and Mill, that notion of pleasure, the happy life is the virtuous life, it, it's a Greek, Greek concept called eudo, eudomia, which is a deeper sense, it's not happiness, it's more like satisfaction, in a sense. And of course, it's a very, Bentham and Mill and Seligman is very Anglo-Saxon or very English sort of philosophical movement out of the Enlightenment. Over in Germany, you know, we get people like uh, Kant who forgets all this happiness stuff uh, and focuses on duty as the, the foundation for ethical thinking. It's a very alien Teutonic thing for English, an English libertarian tradition. And then in France, we get the the, I think the frippery of Foucault and, all, and that sort of stuff, who, who actually got Bentham all wrong, I think, so completely inverted his meaning, deliberately and wrongly. But coming back to the main theme here, we're going to go on this journey where we explore the notion of happiness, how it came to be as a almost philosophical and uh, ethical issue. Is it the goal in life to be happy? Some would say it is. I am not one of those people. Uh, but we're going to we're going to come through. The way in which that changed through Mill and then got captured and crystallized with Seligman and came on through to, into the what we maybe commonly call the well-being industry now. Uh, that's got a direct lineage here, all the way from Aristotle in a sense to, to well-being. So that's the journey we're going to, to go on today. But these people were, you know, Bentham and Mill were very much children of the Enlightenment. Out of the Enlightenment comes, uh, comes some quite strange things in a way. You have uh, Marxism. Uh, which is very strong in France and particularly, obviously, the Soviet Union and results in the horrors of dialectical materialism. Uh, but in some ways, Bentham and Mill are very English characters. You know, it's almost a reaction to the French Revolution. Uh, you know, 
uh, their libertarian views. It's much more about the individual, a very British way of thinking. That's a lazy fair. Individual rights matter. It's not the collective state that matters, which was certainly the case in Germany and became the state in France. Others will see Bentham actually was hugely admired in revolutionary France. Uh, he became an honorary citizen, in fact, uh, in that context. So interesting, interesting man, as we're about to find out. Okay, so, um, you know, if you've uh, tuned in, worried that you might get short measure, no, nope, it's going to be <laughs> the, the full thing. Um, very seriously focused on happiness. You could call it a happy hour without yeah. the cheap drinks. <laughs> So first of all, Jeremy Bentham, 1748 to 1832, uh, was an English philosopher, jurist and social reformer regarded as the founder of modern utilitarianism. Born in Houndsditch, London, a child prodigy studied Latin at the age of three. By the age of seven, he would perform Handel sonatas during dinner parties. Annoying child. Attended Queen's College, Oxford, called to the bar but never practised law. An atheist, quite possibly had Asperger's fell in love many times and wrote about sex but never married. Chiefly famous for inventing utilitarianism, which can be summed up um, by his famous quote, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. Important uh, sentence that. Also, he was an anti-colonialist. He believed in women's equality, animal rights. Unusually for his time, he thought that homosexual acts were not unnatural, but merely irregularities of the venereal appetite. That's okay then. He sits now to this day mummified um, at the University College London. He was in the foyer of uh, UCL, I think it's now in the, the, the student centre, in a glass case. Now he gave detailed instructions in his will for what was to happen to his body after death um, and he called it his auto icon. Strangely up-to-date phrase. <laughs> it uh, the, the body was given to his friend, Dr. Southwood Smith, uh, in accordance his, with his wishes, who later donated it to UCL. Donald, wonderful things and also very strange things went on in Bentham's brain. But what went on in that brain with regards to learning? Yeah, you're, you're right. You reminded me that it, it, it was indeed at one point that's a dark foyer bit at UCL we used to pass. I'm just sitting there staring out. It's a very odd, a mummified philosopher sitting in the foyer of a philosopher, of a, of a, uh, London University. But of course, there was a point to that mummification process because he himself in his will uh, demanded that, uh, that, you know, really detailed uh, directions for the preservation of his corpse. He wanted to be publicly dissected and with an invited audience. Mm. But the whole point of that was to a utilitarian point, which we're about to discuss, which was to bring happiness to people in the sense of taking the fear out of death. It was actually quite a deliberate move by him. And so, in a sense, he's he's drawing on the scientific tradition and the measure of things. He's measuring everything by happiness, and even even his self mummification was part of that process. And of course, he's still sitting there somewhere, UCL, uh, staring out at students whenever they enter the university. But to to, to get onto the serious stuff with Bentham, you're right. This utility principle lies at the heart, the beating heart of his whole uh, his whole thought. And the idea that the greatest happiness principle itself is still alive, alive and kicking. But of course, what he did was on measuring people. So focus on that word measurement. He was obsessed by measuring happiness. But he linked it, therefore, to a feeling, which was pleasure, pleasure and pain. It's important that there are two things here. And on pleasure, he came up with this uh, hedonistic calculus. Or, uh, the original term in the book was called felicitic calculus, but a hedonistic calculus. So he's trying to measure pleasure because he thinks happiness is the goal which we should all try and encourage in society and for our own selves. Maximizing happiness is to maximize pleasure. So what's pleasure? Well, he measures its, in, he has a number of criteria here. He measures its intensity, the intensity of the feeling, how long it lasts, its duration, the certainty of it. You know, how certain am I that this really is pleasure as opposed to as a illusory thing? It's proximity to us, proximity to the self and, and the person, how productive it is. And a couple of other things, rather odd ones, one called purity, and I was, is it pure pleasure? Uh, and the extent or reach of that pleasure. So he has this calculus, a bit like a mathematical measuring instrument 
for pleasure and happiness. He, he, he then goes on to classify this. <laughs> As you say, he, he's a bit of an obsessive character into 14 pleasures and 12 pains. So happiness for him is something you could calculate for any action. And the important thing about utilitarianism, I think, sometimes forgotten, is it's a consequentialist theory. So what does that mean? It means that actually whenever you're about to take an action or decide on a policy, you must think of the future events or consequences first. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is this seems reasonable at first uh, when you when you first hear hear it, but there is there are several big problems with this, of course, because it may very well be that the consequence is solving a problem, but you're sacrificing something in the short term. You may, for example, because he definitely does not say that we should get rid of adultery or even murder. You know, the utilitarian principle oddly allows you to hang someone in the short term if you think it's a deterrence for the long-term happiness of the greatest number of people. Now, not many people would agree with that principle when you really unpack it in that manner that you can sacrifice people for a, uh, for, for a long-term principle. Uh, but uh, Mill and others amend it so you don't fall into that trap and bring in the harm principle. But nevertheless, uh, utilitarianism seems great on the surface, but when you dig a little bit deeper, it starts to unravel somewhat. <laughs> yeah, despite his, um, you know, bringing a kind of calculus and a scientific approach to happiness, so the, the promising to me about you know, you've got a lot of abstract, abstract nouns that are kind of difficult to yeah. pin down, like kind of happiness, pleasure, harm, and so on. And this just seems to go round and round. But it, it's interesting what you say about consequentialism. My, my understanding of that is that it is still a kind of part of philosophy. Yeah. Utilitarianism is felt to be a subset of, of, of it. Yes, and it's contrasted very strongly with those who believe there are you know, just almost universal principles like human, the normal, the normal uh, ethical realm really uh, for discourse now is human rights or universal rights, mm. a deontological, almost God-given set of rights that we as people have. That's a bit odd, actually, because it, it has echoes of a, a sort of thou shalt commandments view of the world around justice, for example, or rights. But that's very much the, the modern milieu is not actually utilitarian. Although utilitarianism itself, I think, is an incredibly useful tool for just making some of those, uh, you know, heuristic decisions about what's good and bad in things. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people skew it off and get it all wrong here. Uh, but, you know, it, it has its uses, as we see when we're going on to Mill. But, you know, going back to going back to Bentham, it's important to see Bentham and Mill are not really high-end philosophers. Uh, they are they're really political characters. You know, Mill, Mill was an MP, but uh, Bentham himself was really a reformer. Uh, you know, he studied the law, but didn't want to become a lawyer, but was fascinated by the penal system, for example, mm -hmm. and his famous uh, Panopticon, where, where all prisoners could be seen from the central hub. Okay, you know? yeah, let's get on to that, because that, that kind of comes out of his, he, he, his, his other big claim to fame, in a way. Um, he's known for his belief that transparency is a moral value, um, and that led to this, the design for this prison, the Panopticon. You see diagrams of this on the web. Everybody can be seen all the time. Um, so it needs less of staff, you know, um, not so many people to staff it from the start. Yeah. Um, actually, his brother Samuel's idea, the Panopticon, um, That's right. yeah, getting yeah. it built became uh, Jeremy Bentham's lifelong obsession, in a, in a way. He spent many years trying to persuade the British government to commit to the plan without success. But there, there were various sites for it. One of them was on Millbank, apparently. Yeah. Which, which um, in, in the end, they decided it wouldn't work because it was too marshy and horrible. Um, I wouldn't try to draw <laughs> any, um, any comparisons there. Um, but the, the whole idea of the Panopticon got the French philosopher Foucault going, didn't it? Yeah, he got all in a fuss around this in his in his book Discipline and Punish in the seventies. You know, it was it was all the rage then, and still is, I think, stupidly. But I think Foucault, it's a terrible book, Discipline and Punish, especially with this caricature of the Panopticon and Bentham, because it was more than a caricature; it was just plain wrong. So, you know, Bentham's idea in the early nineteenth century uh, was the idea of. I mean, it wasn't really a surveillance thing, really. 
Bentham's idea was to create a more educated, critical set of citizens with useful leaders and so on, not this sort of Foucault and nightmare that, that were, is often presented uh, uh, for, on the back of that book, Discipline and Punish. Uh, so an education himself is quite a liberal figure. He really did hate the idea that one should be punishing either children or adults. He thought that we should be making decisions around learning and education that were useful for people to be autonomous beings, far from being the slaves of delusion, and uh, uh, as Foucault would have, have us believe. Bentham believed very strongly in critical thinking. Utilitarianism really is about the individual and in the individual rights. It's driven by that self striving. It's not a collective view of the world, in a sense. It's the sum of individual freedoms as long as you don't do harm to other people as, as a sort of moderating influence here. And in learning, of course, the panopticon idea is taken by Bentham in his book, The Crestomathia, I think it means from, from Greek, it means useful learning, so a book about learning and education. Uh, and the idea was more like a sort of lecture theater. And the idea that was to make people more individual autonomous learners, to stop them cribbing from other students. Uh, to cut them off from the outside world, as it were, and to give them focus. And also a big thing for, for them, remember, as individualistic philosophers, both Mill and Bentham, is the idea of avoiding groupthink. This was their big enemy. They hated groupthink. Mill, in his book on liberty, also Bentham. The whole movement in education on Bentham and Mill was about freedom of thought, the ability to think for yourself, autonomous learners, the very opposite of the Foucaultian charge. Hmm. So, of course, he, he could, I, I mean, part of the problem is that he couldn't have known in the time that he wrote about the surveillance state, of, you know, that came in the 20th century, um, our own uh, technological situation now where kind of everything is known, every, every, every swipe, every click, uh, every, everything we watch is in a server somewhere owned by you know a huge american tech company and yes. can be kind of hacked and misused and abused for commercial political um uh reasons and and, and so on i mean none of that existed uh no. co kind of pulls out the panopticon uh, as, as a kind of image which is resonant um in the in in the context of the society of the spectacle and you know everything that happens in French philosophy in twentieth century, so now we we feel we're all in a kind of panopticon, but it, it's very far divorced from anything that, as you say, that that Bentham would have thought about. Yeah, I think that's right. It's a nice segue actually into Mill here because with Mill we have a more realistic view of utilitarianism away from the hedonic calculus into a much more sophisticated thing that hails back to Aristotle a little bit more here. He brings in. Uh, you know, a wider sense of that's of of the word happiness, and so I think. Good. But in relation to the Foucaultian thing, he also brings in the harm principle in his right. I, you know, I think it should be compulsory reading for everybody. The book on liberty. So you know, what, they're still sticking to this individual freedom view, which is a very strong thing in English politics and culture to this day. Mm. Uh, but it's tempered by that notion of not doing harm to others. And by harm, they mean harm. They don't mean, oh, I got upset because you said something. You know, that, that's a line. They meant actual harm, hmm. uh, actual violence or, or, uh, or, you know, or let's say the destruction of somebody's job yeah. or, or whatever, the cancel culture. They would have hated that. They, they were libertarians at heart. Yeah. Uh, so, so should we move on to John Stuart Mill? Yeah, I think that is a good point to move on to him because this the, the, the tempering of the hedonic calculus is exactly what, what Mill did. We hope this podcast ups your knowledge about learning. But did you know learning podcasts, that's audio training created according to evidence-based principles, is a powerful and fast-growing medium. Assemble You is an audio-first provider with a ready-built course library to help your people improve productivity leadership, well-being, and more in their downtime. Assemble You also creates audio courses unique to your company or institution. Try it free today at assembleyou.com slash greatminds, all one word. So, 
So John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, English philosopher, political economist, member of parliament and civil servant, one of the most influential thinkers in the history of classical liberalism. And as you say, we still think through uh, in ways that he gave us to think. He contributed widely to social theory, political theory and political economy. He's been dubbed the most influential English speaking philosopher of the 19th century. He conceived of liberty as justifying the freedom of the individual in opposition to unlimited state and social control. Um, so popular with some uh, libertarians. Also born in London, raised to be a genius of utilitarianism by his philosopher father James Mill, with help from his friend Jeremy Bentham. He was, he was a family friend. So the poor boy never stood a chance. Uh, <laughs> Mill was kept away from other kids. He was taught Greek from three, Latin from eight, by which age he had also been taught arithmetic, physics and astronomy. By the age of 20, perhaps not surprisingly, he was suicidal. Um, and he was only saved from that, that, that depression, that kind of crisis, by reading the poet Wordsworth, um, which I'd recommend, actually. <laughs> Uh, barred from attending Oxford or Cambridge by his non-conformist faith, which is an interesting one, he joined the East India Company instead at 17 and became a colonial administrator. Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, wrinkle with Mill and leads to things that, that seem quite contradictory. He was an apologist for empire, who hiss, but anti-slavery, hurrah, and a strong champion of the rights of women, a very strong champion. In his 40s, he married Harriet Taylor, a British philosopher and women's rights advocate. After her untimely death, they were only together for seven years, he became a Liberal MP advocating easing the burdens on Ireland, giving women the vote, um, advocating social reforms such as labour unions and farm cooperatives, uh, reforming Parliament, reforming voting and extending suffrage. So, you know, a real Liberal. A huge figure in liberalism whose ideas about individual liberty and the state formed the frame, I think it's fair to say, within which we think about incredibly topical matters like freedom of speech and, as you say, to, the, to this day. I mean, I hear quite a, quite a lot at conferences and so on. But Donald, what did he say about learning? How do we justify his position here in this podcast about learning? Yeah, well, like, like Bentham, we believe that edu education would... I, Actually, put more emphasis on education as being a means to attaining happiness. This is because he alters the Bentham hedonic calculus, the idea it's just a simple sort of arithmetic sum, you can work it out, towards it being more quality than quantity. The quality of your, uh, this is why it goes back to the Aristotelian idea of what it is to lead a good life. Well, the quality of life matters. It's not just about being a happy camper, as it were. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there are higher forms of happiness, one of which is education. Okay, but uh, so that uh, in terms of a higher quality form of happiness, he certainly did not believe that education should be just fun, for example, a sort of hedonic view of the world that you hear quite often, bizarrely in my view these days, that, oh, if we only make everything fun, everything will be okay. Well, no, actually just allowing people to get to enjoy themselves is not the point. It's actually a higher goal. It may very well be that you have to work really hard and go through some pain almost to, to reach a very satisfying goal to reveal the truth of a famous philosopher or whatever. So he's very critical of that idea. Nevertheless, he, thought, he thinks that, that hinders rather than helps learning. He thinks that learning is about allowing the individual to fulfill their the, the true potential in life. Uh, and true, and that's what leads to true happiness, the Aaron more Aristotelian view of being autonomous beings. And this is terribly important because it's something I hugely admire in Mill, that notion that education should be about the autonomous self. You're in school, you're teaching kids to become autonomous in the sense of making their way in the world and getting a job, being financially independent, understanding that, looking after their own health, looking after others, and being a citizen in a democratic society. That's what he really did believe that that's what education should be. It had a strong moral purpose, though, in, in a sense. It wasn't about the selfish pursuit of pleasure. You know, it, it's not as if, well, I'll be a gambler and a drug addict. That will keep me happy. I'll, I'll have a life of bliss. No, not for Mill. <laughs> yeah. uh, that would be the very opposite. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. you have all this... Uh, in, a, yeah. Sorry if I... Break it. Sure, had a much closer focus, focus, as you say, on 
<clears throat> the difficulties around that word happiness. And, you know, you mentioned Aristotle with Epicurus as well. You know, the Epicureans yeah, yeah. Are, tend to be seen as 24-hour party people. But in fact, um, if you look at what Epicurus said, he said that, you know, uh, happiness might come through kind of eating bran for breakfast and, and, and a really quite austere lifestyle because you kind of balance off. You have to control your impulse, impulse control if you really want to be happy. You know, yeah. It would give you a longer life and, you know, ultimate more self-actualization, as we, we might say, and so on. There, there, there's a bit of kind of restraint needed in your 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 approach to life rather than, as you say, chasing after happiness. And that's very strongly perhaps from his classical background of reading, you know, Aristotle and Epicurus, the, uh, the very early schooling in Greek philosophers. He, he takes that through. But, of course, you know, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily have that. Um, and people think the greatest happiness of the greatest number just means let's all be twenty-four hour party people. <laughs> yeah, which is which is the very opposite what what he believed and wrote about. I, I was laughing there internally at your your reference to breakfast cereal. There was also a really weird thing that happened in in, in America on the on the back of this a little bit with the famous you know Kellogg's cornflakes. So Mister Kellogg, I don't know if you know the, the story of the Kellogg's, were actually invented as a sort of corny crisp thing that, that that would be put in mattresses to spot whether uh, boys were masturbating or not which yeah. is an amazing sort of story <laughs> but the the idea that you know the idea that uh, that that this was about the restriction of the individual uh, through religious impulse is the furthest thing from the minds of Bentham and Mill mm. and indeed I think the really important second big theme in Mill is the notion the, uh, of liberty. So in the book on liberty, 1859, so it's exactly the year, this, that's the year that uh, Origin of Species was uh, published as well. You have this amazing book that talks about compulsory universal education for every citizen, especially women. Uh, he was, he was a, you know, emphasized this hugely in this book. All the way up to university entrance, we have universal education. And he's critical of the idea that, uh, that education should be provided by the state. He thought that the state would then start to interfere with the autonomous uh, liberty of the individual. Very interesting view that, you know, that the state mm. imposes a curriculum, imposes religious studies, which he thought should never be taught in schools. Religion should be a, as a subject of opinion. It should not be taught as part of the curriculum. Mm. And then I think you're right. You mentioned earlier that he actually writes he writes subject, uh, the, the subjection of women about a decade later, and that calls upon these principles to defend the emancipation of women. And because he thought that, again, society was suppressing women and making them conform, conform to what men think, that patriarchal idea. Uh, he's writing this stuff very, very early, you know, uh, also against slavery, but it comes back to this libertarian view that you as an autonomous human being should be able to fulfill your potential through learning and education. And so you have to make this case, if you believe that, for absolute equality of opportunity, mm. certainly. Because the, the, the freedom which education gives you, in a sense, emancipates you <clears throat> from groupthink, the state, whatever. You know, you should be a free individual, free to think what you want, within reason. Which is why the harm principle, which I think is a, a fantastic fulcrum for debating ethics around anything, whether it's AI, is just ask yourself that question. Do my actions, that's all very well giving me freedom, but do my actions actually harm someone? And of course, you can argue there's a huge philosophical debate about what the word harm means. I think Mill was quite clear what it means. I think we've stretched it elastically to mean almost anything now. So if I say anything, you're going to be harmed by it. Well, really? If that's the case, Mill thought that the plural pluralism of ideas and debate would would disappear, and that educational institutions would would atrophy because you weren't allowed to really say what you thought. And uh, I think that's certainly a big debate uh, in, in this in this day and age. So fascinating figure, towering intellectual figure, towering politician, massively influential certainly in the UK because. The cult, political culture and so on in the, in the UK are very different in a way from France and Europe in that you have this libertarian individualism, yeah. which affects the thoughts of everybody, especially in England. I, I think less so in Scotland, but it's mm. certainly in English culture. There is a view of Mill um, 
on the, on the right, perhaps we say on the far right, that um, the, the, some of the apparent contradictions in his, you know, support with him being a, a, a colonialist for um, colonialism and saying that subject peoples shouldn't have in, in colonies shouldn't have the same kind of rights as you know white people, whatever, uh, and so on is part of an earlier mill um, that uh, they approve of. And when you get to the marriage um, to his feminist wife, that's where it all goes wrong. And um, a bit of women blaming here. She turned him into this kind of mealy mouth, libtard, uh, woke fool. And, and that you have a before mill and an after mill. It, it's that a complete fabrication? Did he undergo change halfway through his life? Or is there, you know, can you see a coherent kind of... Um, uh, body of thought throughout his life that hangs together. Yeah, you get this sort of biographical nitpicking. Yeah, I think which I think, you know just kind of it's, I find that often bizarre because you know the picking away at whatever little bones you can find, whether it's something he said in colonialism or something he said in colonialism, by and large, his body of work is clear. It's a man I've read in some depth. You don't get that sense that the. He is a defender. I mean, you know, he writes against slavery. He writes, he writes a whole book on the emancipation of women. Mm. And yet people like to go back. They have, I think we have this view of people that they have to be absolutely perfect. A sort of utopian view of biography, which is totally bizarre to me, that everybody has to be perfect in the past or else they are irrelevant. And I think that sometimes this is, I mean, if you were debating with Mill in this, he's saying, well, fine, you're allowed to say this, but... Uh, that's just the freedom of speech and uh, or expression, as he called it. He didn't call it freedom of speech. He called it freedom of expression. Uh, the very fact that we have that freedom of expression allows you to say these things. But if you go that one step further and start banning my books, that's stupid <laughs> because that's causing harm. Then you're actually atrophying debate and discussion and progress, and you're doing the very opposite of what you think you're doing by simply cancelling out all the other stuff, which is the great body of the work in many of these thinkers, which is largely emancipatory, you know, looking for the uh, the, the the improvement of human rights across the peace, that, that fundamental idea of equality. If we're just going to sort of really nitpick on a biograph biographical detail, which people have done with David Hume and so on, I think uh, we lose far more than we gain. Okay, so... Well, that was a pretty solid answer to that one, John. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots more to say, yeah. Let's move on to um, our next theorist, uh, somebody still alive today of our present day, Martin Seligman, uh, yeah. born in 1942. And I should say, we do hope you're enjoying our little happy hour. And our next theorist is certainly a guy who's guaranteed to turn that frown upside down. Uh, it's going to make you. Martin Elias Peter Seligman is an American psychologist, educator and author of self-help books. Born 1942, still going strong, as I say. He's a Zellerbach family professor of psychology in the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Psychology. Born in New York, studied at Princeton and University of Pennsylvania. Early work on depression led him through experiments on dogs that Jeremy Bentham would definitely not have approved of, uh, being into animal rights, to discover learned helplessness. This is a psychological condition in which a human being or an animal has learned to act or behave helplessly in a particular situation, in other words, not to help themselves, even if the means for them to help themselves exist. Usually after experiencing some inability to avoid an adverse situation for long enough, that they just kind of give up. Um, he's more famous for his theories of positive psychology and well-be well-being, but they kind of lead, lead lead on from learned helplessness in in a sense. Um, Donald, is it his basic idea that if you can learn to be helpless, you can also learn to be happy? Is that it, or am I massively oversimplifying? No, so I think we get we. Seligman is an odd figure in the sense that I think we get a debased form of Seligman when we discuss him. You know, he's the sort of pied piper of happiness yeah. <laughs> or the pied piper of positive psychology. But people forget about the thing you just mentioned there, that actually his core work, his earliest work was in his learned helplessness thing, 
which actually wanted to redefine psychology away from that because he thought the US in particular had got obsessed by this diagnosis of mental disorders, that everything had become a mental disorder and that that was a bad thing and that it had led to massive drug use in the US, especially opiates. And boy, was he right on that one. <clears throat> However, people people take this and put it into the, the well-being world, we'll maybe discuss this later, and regard him as some sort of defender of helplessness and that we should be constantly looking for helplessness amongst our employees or learners. But he thought the very opposite, actually. He thought that positive psychology was a cure to that, not a, not a thing in itself. So this brings us back to the happiness debate, of course. And they, you know, go back to the Greeks, Bentham Mill, and so on and so forth. So we, we have... We have the idea that happiness is a very simplistic hedonic calculus with Bentham. Mill comes out and says, well, it's more quality than quantity, but what does Seligman say? Well, unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of Seligman, and that's because I'm not a fan of the book Authentic Happiness. And that came out in the early 2000s and had a massive influence on the learning world and education, but also L&D and the workplace. It was regarded, he really became the Pied Piper for this stuff. And I think it's led to, I will maybe go into this, but I think it's led to some really bad things in HR and L&D and generally in society. Uh, I, I, I think the problem is he takes the word happy or happiness and replaces what you sacrifice here is realism for happiness. It's a very American view of the world. You know, the word happiness is in the Constitution itself, right at the beginning, the foundation of America. And there's almost an obsession with the word that that's the aim of life itself. Life, liberty, and happiness is a right. Life, liber liberty, and happiness, exactly, as if it's some sort of guide for moral and social well-being. And that's, you know, that's, and, and in a sense, in a sense, Seligman comes along and says this, but you get optimum, optimism bias here. So you get all sorts of beliefs that, you know, if I just think it and do it and remain happy and positive, things will happen. But that's what gave us the financial crash. And there is a brilliant book on this called Smile and Die by Bar Barbara Ehrenreich. And yeah. I love her as a writer, but her Very book important. Smile and yeah. Die is a real critique of Seligman uh, and a brilliant critique. So Seligman himself has this, a bit like Bentham, this stupid calculus for happiness. And <laughs> the formula, believe it or not, I don't think many people have actually fully read Authentic Happiness. It's almost absurdly absurd book in my view. And happiness equals S plus F plus C. So think of KFC replacing the K with the S. <laughs> happiness equals a set range in set circumstances with voluntary control. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I, I, now, we could go into a huge amount of detail, but it's a very benthamic uh, view of the world that you can have sort of alternative calculus to this. And then, of course, we have uh, one of the worst journals in the world, I think, is the Journal, journal of Happiness Studies. It would make you extremely unhappy reading the articles from this particular journal uh, because study after study with almost no methodology is pushing a sort of almost a dogma. But mm -hmm. what I liked about uh, Smile and Die, Barbara's book, is that she she blames the whole financial bubble on this. And I think she's right there. All these people coked up and it's like woo woo high five culture, you know, uh, who become these the, the narcissists, the megalomaniacs, and they're still around today. Uh, just have a look at any of our leaders in politics from Trump onwards. But it she puts the charge towards Seligman that this is a sort of fake sincerity. This is not authentic. He calls his book Authentic ha Happiness, but it's the most inauthentic thing imaginable. It's actually a retreat from the real world, den a denial of the complexity of the real world. And so I, and I think she's right on, on her critique of, of Seligman uh, in that sense. Coming to education and training, the podcast is essentially about the Seligman Sellingman's work has led to this reappraisal of our attitudes towards learners and teachers and education and training and its whole social aim here. With this, unfortunately, I think, a focus towards something he wouldn't have liked, and that's the focus on deficit models. And as we go into the workplace, we go into school, we're constantly looking for deficits. Oh, you don't believe this. You don't believe that. You know that a, a person or a learner almost has some form of original sin and that we have to bring them back up to cure them to be normal people again which is the sort of well-being industry in a nutshell. Uh, 
So I think the, the problem here is this core notion of the identification of the concept of pleasure and or happiness. And I think Seligman fails just as Bentham failed. And in a sense, Mill failed as well. Happiness is not, in the end, the peg upon which you can hang every hat on. Hmm. Uh, life is far too complicated for that uh, simplistic reduction to a calculus. He puts things into it that, that, that seem a bit strange to me, like meaning has to be a component of happiness for Seligman, it seems, in his formulation. I don't, if I think of the, the happiest times I've ever spent, I, you know, um, making sandcastles on a beach with my children, with a child, sitting, drawing um, stupid cartoons with one of my kids. It's the, div you know, it's the absolute lack of meaning in the experience, really, <laughs> that, yeah. that makes it, um, make, makes it really such a happy memory. You know, it, it means nothing other than to, just to to kind of experience that that kind of human closeness the, the thought everything has to have a meaning a goal a purpose you know yeah. it, it's very much in business language the other thing i wanted to say though is to ask really is this relentless positivity is seligman can he really get the rap for all of that i mean haven't there been a lot of people that are pushing relentless positivity from kind of samuel smiles onward through dale carnegie um are we yeah. blaming him for too much? Yeah, we made several interesting points there. The first one, John, is you're right. Now, Seligman himself realised that he had gone too far with the happiness formula. Mm. And so I think it was about 10 years later, he writes a second book that people sort of tend to forget, a book called Flourish. Now, Flourish is a more interesting book, I think, where he yeah. talks, goes back to the Aristotelian Greek ideal. You know, you're finding fulfilment through meaning, you know, this meaningful and worthwhile tasks idea. Uh, the living the good life uh, uh, is what it brings to it. But it's a bit of an apology after the event, in a sense, you know, and it still has the second point you make there, this almost religious imperative, which I think also goes back to Aristotle thought there was a telos or a purpose. You had to have a purpose in life. We were here for a purpose. You had to, in a sense, almost live up to your purpose. And that comes through in the book Flourish as well. It's terribly old-fashioned in a way, these ideas that we have a moral, almost religious imperative to make everything meaningful in our lives, when in actual fact, some of the most interesting aspects of your life are accidental, spontaneous, eh, meaningless, but interesting, you know? And I think I think you're onto something there, John, that, you know, a, a real sort of, a, a, it's a real, so a whole, it holds that ship uh, of, of happiness when you bring in these more complicated dimensions of life. And that's where I think they will all go badly wrong in failing to recognize realism and complexity. So moving now to, to towards the summing up, looking back slightly over the uh, 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 almost happier... <laughs> <laughs> how, how direct is the link between the utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill and Seligman's positive psychology? It, it's certainly true that both are extremely pervasive nowadays. People are always talking about Mill in relation to debates such as, you know, driverless cars, free speech on Twitter, what have you. And Selim, Seligman, on the other hand, seems to have completely set the tone of discourse in modern business, you know, with, with qualifications, we said, particularly in L&D and HR. But while the former, Bentham and Mill, opens up an area for debate and disputation, the latter seems really to shut a lot of questions down. Can you really truly be happy if you're never dealing with the negative? I think is beyond what you were saying there. Don't worry, be happy to invoke another song lyric. That doesn't seem like a great way to learn anything, does it? I mean, learning is is about, it involves some difficulty, some encounter with stuff, the unexpected, the, the dangerous, safe place to fail, or all, all that sort of thing. Isn't the positive psychology kind of working against that? Yeah, that's right. So the, the first quarter of the 21st century, uh, we're almost there, has been shaped by this, the Seligman utilitarian agenda almost. Uh, I think in two ways. The first is this idea that we identify meaningful essences in the world, Myers-Briggs, learning styles, leadership traits, my, my least favorite of all those, and all that stuff on IQ, multiple intelligences, emotional intelligence, Bloom Maslow. You get all this search for es essentialism or traits in people. Mm -hmm. If only we could make people understand 
that if they have these essences or traits, the world would be wonderfully positive and utopian. But that's no more than a utopian view. And of course, all of those courses are a bit hokey because real people realize that these sort of bromides and platitudes are not real, that the world is far more complicated than the simple course on, it, uh, on any of those topics would have you believe. But the second big trait, which I think is more insidious in many ways, is the happiness industry, as it were. You know, in a sense, happiness is, becomes a form of dumbing up. <laughs> a, 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 so you get these simple distinctions between happiness is good, unhappiness is bad. Positive feelings good, negative feelings bad. You know, that's puerile, completely puerile and, and quite misleading because it's not true. Uh, you get books from Richard Leonard and so on making the same point. So what we've had in the first uh, you know twenty odd years since uh, since that book by Seligman is that self appointed army really of coaches, counselors, mentors, you know, people in L and DNA, therapists crawling all over organisations, you know, ser- almost on the search for the pathological. You know, I've got to, we've got to find the deficits in people and and cure them. Uh, and of course, everyday emotions and ordinary contention and, and complexity and organizing, it doesn't fit well with this because people are wondering why they're being accused all the time. It's almost as if they're being accused of having original sin or being ill. And all these people with sort of a bit creepy open questioning comes in over a cure. Mm. And I think that's become almost a, a bizarre norm, but it's reached almost absurd, absurd levels now. Some of this comes out in the 1960s and the med, you know, that whole a hippie meditation thing like mindfulness, the therapy narrative also has that route, uh, you know, defined very narrowly uh, in terms of, well, if you're, if you have wellness or well-being, we're assuming that people are unwell. It's very binary in its thinking, you know, so all is not well with wellness, I don't think, you know, and I think there are some amazing studies here that if people really looked at the research in some detail, and the big one for me was the Jones study around that's workplace learning. And I was massively influenced by this because it was, this is dealt with a study dealing with 12,000 employees. And they looked at what do workplace well wellness programs do in organizations, okay? And so they looked at a whole load of things in terms of their actual impact. If you have a wellness program in an organization, does it reduce medical expenditure, increase the health of people? Does it lead to more productivity or, you know, self-reporting of increased uh, wealth? And well, actually, it doesn't. Does it reduce sickness? No, it didn't in that trial. Uh, did it result in more people staying in their job no, or getting promotion or pay rise? No, it didn't. Did it reduce medication or hospital visits? No, it didn't. So I think the problem here is the lack of evaluation around a lot of this effort, the illusion that we're curing an illness when maybe there wasn't an illness in the first place or we're certainly not curing it, even although there may be. Hmm. So there's quite a lot of evidence showing that this stuff doesn't really work. And the HR has shifted away from, you know, the, the sort of worthier stuff of, you know, training people for competence, employee development, pay and rations, all that stuff towards a new role as therapists. You know, now you're going to probe my unconscious, right? You could probe my unconscious, really, but that is happening. That did happen. And I thought this was a bizarre swing on the back of this notion that comes right out of Bentham and Mill and Seligman uh, of this moral purpose, you know, that organizations need values. And I'm going to tell you what these three or four abstract nouns are. And if you don't believe them, you may not fit in here. You may not be welcome in our, our organization. Banks actually say this to employees. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievably, that the way you know that any bank should turn around to any employee and take the the moral high ground on values. I think values are a very personal thing and have no place in uh, in that sort of thing. But I think it, ultimately it's an appeal to narcissism as well. I think that's one of the downsides of this, uh, I, which is one of the reasons that I don't really admire it very much. I think it's self, in a sense, almost self defeating. You know. Valuing happiness is self-defeating because it's the wrong goal, and ultimately it leads to dissatisfaction. You know, there's nothing sadder than the relentlessly happy person who's just laughing and joking all the time. And as I say, you know, some of the most tragic and saddest people on the planet are comedians. You know, that, uh, and I don't think we should be holding this up as the way in which organisations or schooling or education should be should be run. Always seeing the glasses half empty. I don't really see the point in that. Uh, and that we have to cure people with these wellness programs. 
those yeah. seem to be identifying deficits and the education and training and well-being so it's a cure a cure for cognitive deficiencies yeah <laughs> it's interesting that he, he he sort of begins by pushing back against the um you know the the, the medicalization of um yeah, depression right. and so on, and, and against the what? What's the American textbook that you didn't like? The DSM, blah, blah, blah. That's right. That's the that's the text that defines illnesses and syndromes. He felt that they had been overdiagnosing and uh, uh, things as illnesses, and this is why I think you said it right at the beginning. People mm. have actually ended up turning Seligman on his head. He actually his original research and impulse was around learned helplessness and avoiding the over-prescription of deficits in the mind. Hmm. What people are doing now is prescribing deficits everywhere and saying our wellness program, our happiness program, our values will solve these problems when there was no deficit in the first place. It was just normal human nature and behavior and that we'd be much better off going back to a world where we were training people in reasonable competencies for managers to deal with this complexity rather than seeing it as an illness to be cured mm. and the therapeutic tradition which comes of course also from another post enlightenment flourish with freud and carl rogers yeah. uh, and so there's another stream coming into this yeah. but i think we've tracked out the lineage from aristotle to bentham to mill to seligman yeah to i the think last that points forward interestingly to to when we um we we get to kind of deal with freud i was listening to a podcast the other day which is a kind of uh critique of uh, a book called the triumph of the therapeutic uh which was against sort of therapy culture and you know um the the, the way that freudian psychoanalysis kind of affected society and um in in the us and and so on and what kind of came out of that was this feeling that you know what one of the worst things about the whole therapy culture is that it says that there is an answer that there is a solution and it's you know very simple you just kind of go and do it do what i say in my um wellness book and everything will be fine you know eat brand do this do that um as somebody who's been through group therapy uh for depression i can tell you one of the first things you get disabused of is the idea that there's a cure is like yeah. you go to a, a, as an addict you go into a 12-step program uh the first thing they're going to tell you is that there isn't a cure you're going to be an alcoholic for the rest of your life you're going to be a gambling addict for the rest of your life what we're going to teach you here is you know how you kind of grow up and deal with that and there is a kind of it seems to me a strain in seligman that you know it's just kind of don't worry be happy do this and everything will be all right and it will be okay and it just seems kind of detached from reality, as you say. Yeah, that personal experience you've had, John, is illustrative, I think, because that approach that you've been through seems to accept the realism of the world and complexity of people. Uh, I don't know what the book was that you referred to earlier, but there's another really interesting book called Wellness Syndrome by S. Hedestrom and Spicer that does the same thing. They're saying that, you know, this is this stuff's faddish. It has this moral obligation and imperative to regulate your feelings and behavior. But he's saying, well, that's fine, but let's not be utopian about this. And, uh, uh, you know, let, let's not uh, turn it into a moral imperative. Let's not appeal to narcissism. Uh, and let's not brand it as a wellness program. It's actually just dealing with the complexity of people, the cognitive traits and and and. and and the, and the the fortunate or unfortunate circumstances they find themselves in. So it seems that realism was the watchword of the process you went through, which is a good thing, John. It strikes me that the successful programs around alcoholism, drug abuse, and now more modern uh, cognitive behavior therapy and so on, we're getting to the nitty gritty realism of these things, as opposed to the utopianism of silly wellness programs in the workplace. Okay. Looking at the we could go on for quite a long time with this. Looking at the clock, um, I sense the, the the barman of time removing the uh, little <laughs> pink umbrellas from our pina coladas and putting up the prices by double because the PR is over. So, um, cheers to that, John. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Donald, as, again, as always. Yeah, that was good. I mean, you can't, uh, the whole point here was that, that uh, I'll let your happy hour analogy throughout this. Because the whole point is, you know, those happy hours that you go to and then 
you know, you're drinking cocktails and suddenly about eight o'clock you feel ill and find it's not been so happy after all. <laughs> Maybe that's the lesson we learn from happy hours. They're not always good for your health or happiness. Yeah, I, I knew a, a, an owner of a pub who was notoriously um, uh, didn't like people and he used to have grumpy hours. <laughs> <laughs> and the drinks were twice the price. <laughs> which of course they are now with um, you know cost of living we're all living for a, a permanent grumpier on that happy note thank you everybody thank you John Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer sound edit is by Isaac Peacock social media by Jay Curtis graphics by David O'Connor the podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project If you're a fan of these podcasts and want to support us and get exclusive member benefits, go to patreon.com forward slash learning hack.